Welcome to the 2019 Change for Good Luncheon. My name is Rob Rogers, and I'm chair of Healthy Schools Campaign Board of Directors. I'm also the president of School Health Corporation. Thank you for being here today. You are all in this room because you care about the health and long-term success of the children in this city, in our state of Illinois, and across the country. I hope you're looking forward to today's program as much as I am. Healthy Schools Campaign works at the intersection of health, education, and community. Our work focuses on making schools healthier places where every child can learn and thrive. And we are adamant about the need for equitable investment in low income and marginalized communities in order to build thriving schools, communities, and families. I wanna say a big thank you to my fellow Healthy Schools Campaign board members, the many parents, principals, community leaders, partners, and donors who are in the room. I also wanna thank and acknowledge our presenting sponsors, Advocate Children's Hospital and GCM Grosvenor. And a big thanks to all of our Change for Good sponsors, donors, and supporters. Healthy Schools Campaign depends on your generosity to support the dynamic programs and advocacy work this incredible organization oversees. Please familiar, familiarize yourself with the green envelopes on your table and consider making a gift today. We'll be talking more about those envelopes later in the program. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Rochelle Davis, President and CEO of Healthy Schools Campaign. Well, thank you, Rob, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Chicago, like all big cities, is a city of neighborhoods. Where all and when all of our neighborhoods thrive, so will Chicago. Investing in communities, families, and children, especially in low-income communities of color, is essential for Chicago to grow and be a strong, vibrant city. This is also key to building a vibrant state and nation. At the heart of these communities are schools, which is why Healthy Schools Campaign focuses on ensuring that schools support the health and wellness of all children. We believe that all, I'm going to emphasize all children, should have access to good nutrition, school nurses, counselors and social workers, physical activity, basic safety, clean air and water, access to the outdoors, and also have the knowledge and skills to make healthy choices for themselves. Unfortunately, despite the hard work of so many, this is still not the case for many students in Chicago and across the country. Children face many issues, including violence, a lack of health and mental health services, and disinvestment in neighborhood schools. Over the past few years, the prevalence of chronic conditions that impact students' ability to be in school and ready to learn has doubled. And more and more children suffer from a range of mental health issues. These conditions disproportionately impact low-income families and African-American and Latinx children. In Chicago, almost 80% of CPS students come from low-income families. As an analysis recently showed in the most starkest terms, the life expectancy in Streeterville, one of Chicago's most affluent white communities, is 30 years longer than in Englewood, a low-income African-American community. We have a lot of work to do to fully address and dismantle structural racism, and at the core of this work is creating and investing in school environments that can fully support, educate, and care for all of our children. The work that Healthy Schools Campaign does at a state and national level has its genesis in our on-the-ground work in Chicago communities. We use this local experience to develop policy solutions at the district, state, and national levels. For example, when we ran a leadership program for school nurses, we saw the amazing things that school nurses were doing to support students. But we also saw that their numbers were dwindling. 
We looked at the reason why and found that Medicaid did not allow schools to get reimbursed for most of the services that they deliver to Medicaid enrolled students. As a result, districts' scarce education dollars were spent on health services, and those that and there were there was not enough money to, cl to that even came close to meeting the needs of all students. So we took on this issues and successfully advocated for this to change. In order for schools to ask, access these health care dollars, states have to formally seek approval from Medicaid. And we are helping states around the country do just that. In five states that have already successfully petitioned for this change, schools have new funding for nurses, counselors, and social workers. And as a result, more students have, a crucial ac have access to crucial medical and mental health services. Five states down, 45 to go. <laughs> well, 46 when we count the District of Columbia, so. Um, we are uh, taking the, the expertise and experience that we have from working with states around the country to help Illinois and ultimately all CPS students benefit from increased health services. Now today, we will have the honor of hearing directly from grassroots leaders about the issues they have prioritized in their schools and communities. We are pleased to welcome, welcome public officials from the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois who will respond to the issues and priorities raised by our grassroots leaders. Unfortunately, uh, the Chief Education Officer McDade, who was scheduled to join us, uh, is unable to come. She is part of the negotiating team with, uh, to negotiate the contract with the union, and we certainly hope um, that she and her colleagues and union representatives are successful in finding a resolution and certainly understand why she could not be here today. We are still waiting for two of our public officials to come. We know that Jesse Ruiz um, is on his way from the meeting with the governor, and we expect Candace Moore uh, to walk in any moment. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce Rosa Ramirez Richter, Healthy Schools Campaign's Director of Programs and Policies, who will introduce our grassroots panel. Thank you, Rochelle. I'm so happy to be here with all of you in the heart of Pilsen, and also to have many of our parents here in the room with us today, as well as many of our grassroots partners. So thank you so much. Earlier this year, Healthy Schools Campaign presented Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot with recommendations to support student health and wellness. Our recommendations focus on five key areas. Increased access to physical and mental health services, high quality physical education, dynamic green school yards, nutritious school food, and overall increased accountability and transparency. These issues will be the frame for today's program. So increasing access to school health services, not only including mental and behavioral health, is a critical strategy to reach vulnerable children and support student health and academic achievement. Many of these issues affect learning and this disproportionately impacts low-income students and students of color. Any serious effort to address education equity must also address health equity. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Dorian Miller, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago and Director of the Center for Community Health and Vitality at the University of Chicago Medicine. She has dedicated her career to supporting Chicago's children, families, and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosa, and thank you for having, having me here today. Um, I'd like to just provide a few comments to you around the need for mental and behavioral health services in schools. And I wouldn't be a good University of Chicago professor without providing you with a little bit of data to start with. But I think that the data is really illustrative of the challenges that many of our young people face within the schools and also the issue of equity that was just raised in Rose's comments. 
In a 2013 study from the Centers for Disease Control, it was stated that one out of five children and adolescents experience a mental health problem during their school years. And so thinking about the entire time from pre-K up to 12th grade, 20%. Serious mental health problems such as self-injury and suicide are also on the rise amongst our children, yet 60% of students do not receive the treatments they need. Why is that? Now one might speculate that maybe there might be stigmas that are associated with the receipt of mental health services, but actually there is a lack of access to services. With almost 80% of CPS students being classified as economically disadvantaged, Many of these students are on Medicaid as a source of health insurance. As a primary care provider who has worked in the safety net for almost my entire practice career, it is extremely difficult to find providers that will accept Medicaid as a form of health insurance for behavioral health needs. Primary care needs by and large are taken care of, but in terms of mental and behavioral health services, extremely difficult to find. However, research shows that students who receive social, emotional, and mental health support perform better academically and are also better equipped to face life's challenges. In particular, school-based mental health professionals are specially trained to provide services within the learning context. School-based mental health providers are also ability, have the ability to provide better coordination with school services, such as individual education plans. So if you can imagine if a child is seeing someone on the outside and there's a question of being able to get that information from a therapist or a provider into the school system and incorporating that information can be quite tough. And I see some people in the audience who are nodding their heads about some of the challenges that are faced there. Now the question around stigma and acceptability is also something that has been researched and I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, information from a 2013 evaluation that was done on the Elevate programs that were uh, in the city of Chicago done by Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. They were able to show that the second highest utilized service for the Elevate programs in the city of Chicago were behavioral and mental health services, only secondary to school physicals and immunizations. And so there is not only a need, but also demand and uptake for families that are interested in these services. Now the Healthy CPS plan provides a number of services to support overall health for children, including vision and dental services at screenings and referrals. Enhancement of these services in the mental and behavioral health area would fill an essential gap in services in a way that provides students with timely integrated care for so many of the almost 400,000 students attending our school system. Thank you very much. A little tricky microphone here. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. As Rochelle mentioned earlier, there is a new opportunity for schools to receive reimbursement for services they deliver to Medicaid enrolled students. And we hope that by next year, we will be able to count Illinois as one of those states that does just that and, and has made this important change. So this obviously will have a tremendous impact for Chicago Public Schools, which alone they have 235,000 Medicaid enrolled students. So very big impact. Research shows that physically active students are more likely to attend school, are better able to focus, and ultimately just perform better academically. Healthy Schools Campaign has an active base of parent leaders in the Latinx and African American communities. And they have successfully advocated together for CPS to prioritize physical health, build recess back into the school day, and make PE a priority. Chicago Public Schools has responded to these priorities. But as we know, there's always more work to, to be done. So with that, now it is my pleasure to introduce Corondo Locas, a parent and local school council member from Cather Elementary, and Patricia Morales, a parent and local school council member at Brighton Park Elementary. Both are proud members of our Parents United for Healthy Schools. Good morning. As a young woman, I grew up in a very middle class neighborhood. Our school had three gyms, so we had a lot of resources. I lived in Logan Square, 
which is a very safe community where the kids can go outside, play, and be physically fit all the time. But now as a mother of three young girls, I live in a lower income community where we don't have many resources. We don't have three gyms in our school, but we do have a newly renovated schoolyard from the Space to Grow slash Healthy Schools campaign. So in 2015, our school had a very new schoolyard where the kids can safely play. There's a track. We have a newly renovated fitness room in our school, which is free to parents and community members. And I know in a lot of communities, there aren't very safe places for kids to go and play and be physically fit. But I am grateful that our school does have this opportunity to have a safe place for the kids and the community members to go and safely exercise, learn how to ride bikes. The kids can go and just have picnics in the park. I'm very nervous, so excuse me if I'm rambling a little bit. But I am on the LSC, PAC, and every other acronym. I'm very active at the school. <laughs> so I see kids all the time, and I do have a six-year-old who's a little bit overweight, so I'm very, very strongly pushing for physical activity in schools and for the kids to have places where they can go, ride a bike, just run around and play. And I really would like to see that in all schools, not just in the neighborhood where I live. Thank you. Buenos dias. Yo tengo tres hijos. Dos de ellos van a la escuela elemental Brighton Park y una niña en la secundaria High School Benito Juárez. Soy parte de Padres Unidos por más de siete años. Gracias a lo que aprendí en Padres Unidos, vi la importancia de involucrarse en las escuelas. Ahora soy presidenta del concilio local de mi escuela. He participado en, el, en los concilios, en el, perdón, en los comités de bilingües, en el del PAC y en el equipo de salud. I'm going to translate for Patricia. So, good morning, I have three children, two children at Brighton Park Elementary and one girl at Benito Juarez High School. I've been a part of Parents United for more than seven years. Thanks to what I learned in Parents United, I saw the importance of getting more involved in my, in my children's schools. I'm currently the president of the Brighton Park Local School Council and I also have participated in many committees with acronyms as well. Uh, the the Wellness Team PAC and the Bilingual Action Committee. La, la primera campaña donde me involucré fue el de regresar la, la, el recreo a las escuelas públicas. En mi infancia yo sí tuve recreo en la escuela de mi país. Recuerdo con alegría esos momentos que me ayudaron a socializar, a refrescar mi mente, y correr y jugar. Lo que cada niño merece para ser exitoso en la escuela. The first campaign I got involved with was the campaign to bring back recess into the school day. In my childhood, back in my country, I had recess at school. I remember with joy those moments that helped me socialize, refresh my mind, run and play, everything that a child deserves to be successful in school. En contraste, mis hijos no tenían recreo. Se quejaban de qué tan largo era el día, cansado y aburrido. Y trabajando con los padres nos dimos cuenta de la importancia que ya tenía más de 25 años que no existía el recreo en las escuelas públicas. In contrast, my children did not have recess, and they would complain about how long the day was, how tired and bored they were. And by organizing and working with other parents, we were able to bring back recess. Um, but we also found out that schools had been without recess for 25 years. Como madre, he visto el cambio ahora que hay más actividad física en las escuelas. Mis hijos disfrutan del día escolar, están de mejor ánimo, han mejorado su atención, se enfocan más y tienen más, mejores calificaciones. Y eso es para mí muy importante. As a mother, I've seen the difference that more physical activity in schools can make. My children look forward to and enjoy the school day, are in a better mood, and have improved their attention, focus, and just have better grades. This is very important to me. Pero el trabajo no se termina ahí. No solamente el recreo es importante, sino que todos los niños tengan una, una educación física de calidad y que las escuelas tengan los recursos y apoyo necesarios. En mi experiencia y de otros padres, hemos visto que hay escuelas sin maestros de educación física o falta de lugar o gimnasio adecuado. Y falta encontrar un equilibrio entre los horarios. Necesitamos equipo, recurso y sobre todo necesitamos que la clase de gimnasio se vea como una prioridad. But the work does not end there. Not only is recess important, but it's also important that children have high quality physical education and that schools have the necessary resources and support. 
In my experience and those from other parents, we have seen that there are schools without PE teachers, without adequate facilities, equipment, scheduling challenges, and above all, we need for physical education to be seen as a priority during the school day. Por eso, Padres Unidos para Escuelas Saludables, estamos alzando nuestra voz para que una educación física de calidad para todos. Y hemos colectado más de 4,000 testimonios en favor de la educación física para demostrar que esto es de alta importancia para nuestros hijos. That is why I, along with Parents United for Healthy Schools, we're raising our voices in support for high quality physical education for all students. To show PE matters to us parents and our children, we've collected more than 4,000 testimonials in support of physical education. Just as it has, thank you. Yeah. Just as it has been possible to return recess to schools, together we can find solutions so that all children are active and ready to learn and grow. Instituciones, gobierno del estado y de la ciudad, CPS, comunidad, padres, maestros, principales, debemos unirnos para lograr tener una educación de alta calidad para todos los niños de las escuelas. Cada niño merece educación física de alta calidad. Muchas gracias en nombre de todos los padres. State and city government officials, CPS, the state of Illinois, partners, parents, students, teachers, we must unite to achieve a high quality PE program for all children in our schools. Every child deserves high quality PE. And on behalf of all parents, thank you so much. A round of applause for the We do another round of applause for them. That was so great. Thank you. I know they were nervous, but they didn't look it, right? So our recommendations to support physical activity and promote wellness include strengthening both state and CPS policies to bring them into alignment with recommended practices. All children deserve high quality PE that is taught in fully equipped facilities with the right resources and outdoor space from qualified teachers who receive ongoing professional development that is specific to their field. Uh, so we are so pleased to be co-chairing a CPS task force to learn how schools are meeting the district's policy, understand the gaps, the challenges, and identify the resources so, we, so all schools can benefit from high quality PE. So through on the ground work with our schools and also hearing firsthand from parents and caregivers and other school stakeholders, we really have learned about the poor conditions and the lack of, of facilities in many of our, our schools and especially the outdoor space. And this is one of the main reasons we've partnered with Open Lands to start Space to Grow. So five years ago in 2014, Healthy Schools Campaign and Open Lands, our region's conservation organization, um, we launched Space to Grow, a program that brings together capital funding from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and also from the, Greater, from the City of Chicago Department of Water and of course, Chicago Public Schools. And our goal was to build dynamic green schoolyards at CPS schools. Space to Grow transforms these spaces into safe, vibrant and dynamic spaces for students, their families and the community. This is where learning and active play takes place, but it also has an added benefit. It captures, there's a green stormwater infrastructure that captures and reduces neighborhood flooding. It's a win for children, neighborhoods, and our city, which has seen much more frequent and heavy rainfalls, as many of you can attest to your poor basements. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce to you um, Principal Fernando Kim from Gonzalez Elementary. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Um, I thank Healthy School Campaigns and their partners for creating this space and time for us to gather together. Uh, as it was said, my name is Fernando Kim and I'm the principal at Gonzalez Scholastic Academy. Uh, como se ha dicho, yo soy el director de la Escuela Gonzalez y estoy muy agradecido de estar aquí con ustedes. Y le agradezco a Healthy School Campaigns y a todos los miembros que están aquí por proveer el tiempo y el horario para hablar de cosas tan importantes como estas esta tarde. 
Back in November of 2016, our school community cut the ribbon for a space to grow, schoolyard transformation, almost two years in the making. As an invaluable partner uh, in helping our school communities to live healthy lives, Open Lands through Space to Grow School Years now serves more than 8,100 students and about 500 teachers have access to outdoor school education spaces. Our school is no exception to these statistics where students and teachers make use of their outdoor learning environment to learn and grow throughout the year. We're blessed to have South and North fields that allow our students and community members to exercise and stay active before, during, and after school hours. Having our own garden and field allow us to say that working on being healthy is important and a priority. Space to grow school years include outdoor classrooms, edible gardens, native plant gardens, play equipment, turf fields, and sport courts to ensure that students are healthy and active and have a daily connection to nature. This is all essential to ensuring a holistically healthy environment for kids to learn and play and for families and community neighbors to be active and connect with one another. Our work with Healthy School Campaigns, Chicago Public Schools, and Open Lands and other partners here in this room have inspired us to even take uh, our gardening club all the way to a farm in Vermont. 35 students went there the past two years to learn how to run the farm, uh, spend doing farm chores, uh, milking cows, making cheese, uh, really taking care of animals, but also learning how to take care of themselves and their environment. Um, as a result of this inspiration that we receive to connect with nature in our more uh, primal and primitive but original side of us as human beings, um, we have been able to encourage active participation during the school day and outside of it so that then we have about 98% of our students attending school every day throughout the year. We're the sixth best attended school in the entire district and we do believe that you know, our zero suspension rate as well as our opportunities to spend time camping outdoors and connecting with nature have come out of such wonderful partners and the time uh, that we spend in our fields as well. The school year also impacts our local community as it was mentioned earlier. Um, you really should see uh, and visit our school in our neighborhood in Brighton Park on a Saturday or Sunday and see hundreds of people uh, from our uh, neighborhood using this space uh, with smiles on their faces and with glad enjoyment. Why is all of this uh, and your partnership through the years to come important? Because according to scientists, we're facing for the first time in American history a generation of children that will not outlive their parents due to wellness issues, poor nutrition, and lack of exercise. A fairly recent study of the Journal of the American Medical Association has seen the doubling of screen time for children under the age of two from 1.35 hours to three hours a day in just 10 years. The World Health Organization said earlier this year that infants under one year old, uh, infants under one year old should not be exposed to electronic screens and that children between the ages of two and four should not have more than one hour of sedentary screen time each day. But taking away iPads and other electronic devices is only part of the solution. Children under five should also get more exercise and sleep in order to develop the better habits that will stave off obes obes obesity and diseases in adolescence and to adulthood. Just like you saw as you were coming in, the title says A Matter of Life. This is really the work of a matter of the lives of children of color, immigrants, and those who are underserved in our city. And we hope and pray that you'll continue to support our schools that are here today and many more in the years to come. Support healthy school campaigns, open lands, and all the organizations so that children can have access to the quality of life and education that they deserve. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Principal Kim. I think all of us could say Gonzalez Scholastic Academy is very lucky to have you and your leadership there. 
Um, we are so lucky to have uh, you as a partner for Space to Grow, but we also are urging our city, our school district, and regional leaders to continue working with us to ensure that more children and more families can learn and play in a Space to Grow schoolyard. This month, we will be opening our 20th schoolyard. Um, we are committed to building 34, so 14 more, but we are also, our aim is to have a green schoolyard in every neighborhood and, and every part of Chicago. Um, as we are completing this first phase, um, we ask you that we keep space to grow as, and build it into a citywide model and you know, really focus on, on this investment as equitable and as powerful it can be in Chicago's low-income communities of color. Every school meal presents the opportunity to support a school's core mission of education. Put simply, healthy, well-nourished students are more likely to attend school, be engaged, and be ready to learn. In Chicago, where many students rely on school food for most of their meals, the meal program helps address food insecurity. In this context, it is critical that the meals that students receive every day at school are healthy. We have a long history of working with Chicago Public Schools to improve school food and also to increase access to the free school meal programs here in Chicago, but also at the national level. We also elevate student voices in this important conversation through our Cooking Up Change Healthy Cooking Contest, and parents and caregivers have been absolutely the backbone of our efforts to transform the school meal program. So with that, I am pleased to introduce you to Erlinda Arriaga. She is a parent and local school council member at Talcott Elementary, and she is also a proud member of our Parents United Leadership Program. Linda. Buenas tardes. Como madre inmigrante de tres niños, deseo una mejor calidad de vida en este país. Y para lograrlo he aprendido que trabajar en equipo uh, con las personas que me rodean es la clave. Yo firmemente creo que todos merecemos una oportunidad justa para llevar una vida saludable. Y también creo que las escuelas desempeñan un papel clave y poderoso para asegurar el bienestar de todos nuestros estudiantes. As an immigrant mother, I came to this country in search for a better quality of life. And to achieve this dream, I have learned that it is key to work together with the people around me. I firmly believe that we all deserve a fair opportunity to lead a healthy life. And I also believe that schools play a powerful role in ensuring the well-being of our students. Pero siempre no pensaba así. Antes creía que yo sola debería de trabajar en la salud y bienestar de mis hijos y familia. No sabía que toda una comunidad sufría de obesidad, sobrepeso y todas las enfermedades relacionadas con esto. La comida escolar ha cambiado durante los últimos años para mejor, pero no siempre fue así. But I didn't always think this way. Before, I used to believe that I, I should struggle alone to make sure my children and my family are healthy. I did not know that whole communities suffered from obesity and overweight and all the diseases related to this. School food has changed in recent years, for the better, but it was not always like this. Hace nueve años, decidí involucrarme con Padres Unidos para Escuelas Saludables en la campaña para traer el programa de desayuno en el salón de clase. Hoy en día tenemos la póliza no solamente en el nivel elemental, sino también en el nivel de secundaria. Este es el poder de la voz de los padres. Nine years, nine years ago, I decided to get involved with Parents United for Healthy Schools in the campaign to launch the Breakfast in the Classroom initiative. Today, the Breakfast After the Bell, the policy as it is known now, is not only implemented at the elementary school level, but it's also at the high school level too. This is the power of parent voices. Hoy en día estamos ayudando a mejorar la comida escolar. Recientemente ayudé a lanzar una encuesta de comidas escolares que recopiló comentarios de padres y estudiantes sobre el programa de comida. Las encuestas también crearon mayor conciencia entre padres, estudiantes, escuelas y el distrito. Now we are currently helping to improve school food. Recently I helped launch a school meal survey that collected feedback from parents and students about the meal program. The surveys help create greater awareness and understanding among parents, but also students, schools, and the district. Los cambios que se están viendo después de esta campaña incluyen un comedor con una atmósfera acogedora, 
menos comida en el bote de basura, menús más a la vista, mejor sabor y más atractivos, más variedad y especialmente ha ayudado a fortalecer las fuentes de comunicación y seguimos trabajando para identificar otras necesidades como tener opciones para estudiantes de educación especial con diferentes sensibilidades a ciertas comidas. The changes that we are seeing after this campaign include better dining environments, less food in the trash can, menus that are more accessible and visible to children especially, more variety, better tasting and more attractive meals. But it's especially important it helps strengthen the communication between the community and CPS. We're continuing to identify other needs, such as having options for special education students with different sensi sensitivities to certain foods. Muchos cambios se han llevado a cabo en nuestra cultura gracias a programas iniciados en la escuela. Por ejemplo, programas de nutrición como padres, para padres y estudiantes para aprender sobre la alimentación saludable. Con el liderazgo de nuestra directora Olimpia Baena, hemos podido reforzar a un ambiente escolar más saludable. Esto ha, está haciendo una gran diferencia. Many changes have been made in our culture thanks to programs initiated at the school. For example, nutrition programs for parents and students to learn about healthy eating. And with the leadership of, of Principal Ms. Olympia Baena, we have been able to create a healthier school environment. This is making a huge difference. En, en conclusión, he aprendido que trabajar juntos es crucial para hacer cambios en la familia, nuestras escuelas y en la comunidad. Hoy les pido a nuestros oficiales y a CPS que sigamos trabajando y for fortaleciendo los cambios positivos que están sucediendo. No es mov momento de echarnos para atrás, sino de seguir para adelante. Los niños son nuestro futuro. Sigamos avanzando, si se puede. Sí se puede. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to quickly translate what she said. So she said that, in conclusion, I've learned that working together is crucial to make changes in the family, our schools, and in the community. Community. And so today she's asking public officials and CPS to continue working and strengthening the positive changes that are happening. That it is not time to back down, but to continue going forward. Children are our future, and si se puede. No translation needed, right? <laughs> So CPS has been a leader in ensuring that students have access to healthy school meals that meet high nutrition standards, and we are excited to work with the district to push the envelope even further. At the same time, the federal school meal uh, standards, which were greatly improved under the Obama administration, are under attack. We applaud the state of Illinois for joining other states in suing the Trump administration for their recent rollback of nutrition standards. And we thank CPS for publicly committing to nutrition standards grounded in science. We look forward to working with the state and district leaders to put on even stronger policies and practices in place. So thank you to our parents, school, and community leaders for bringing their powerful voices to, the, to this conversation. With that, Rochelle Davis will talk more about our priorities and introduce our public officials. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you, uh, Rosen, and thanks to Dr. Miller, Karanda, Patricia, Principal Kim, and Herlinda. We all know the important role that schools play in helping children learn and thrive, and I think um, our parents and principal and Dr. Miller certainly underscored that for us. Um, but it is more important than ever to ensure that cities, school districts, states, and the federal government are meeting their obligation to educate and fully support all students. And it is important to be transparent about the disparities in resources that exist between schools. We know from experience that when policies aren't equitably funded and implemented, disparities persist. Accountability and transparency are core to our policy agenda because we know that what gets measured gets done. We also know that information is essential for parents and other stakeholders to understand what is happening in their schools and communities. So our policy recommendations also include um, some specific ways that both the city and the state um, and CPS can improve transparency and accountability. 
We are pleased that Mayor Lightfoot has focused on these themes of equity, neighborhood investment, education, and accountability. And we have been very happy to hear Governor Pritzker prioritize health, children, equity, and accountability as well. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the public officials we have here with us today. They have been listening intently to our program and the testimonials of our grassroots leaders. We have asked them to come here today to listen and to share their reactions and priorities for this important work. First, I am very pleased to introduce Candace Moore, the Chief Equity Officer for the City of Chicago and the first person to ever have this role for Chicago. Needless to say, she's new to her position, but she has a long track record of addressing issues of equity and education in Chicago, and we are very happy to have her in this role for the city and happy to have her here with us today. Ms. Moore has another engagement after this, so she will have to leave right after she makes her remarks, but we know that this is just the start of our conversation with her. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for putting on this event. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the opportunity to listen. Um, I feel like one of the transitions in this new role is just how fast uh, many conversations happen. And so I appreciate a space where I can sort of sit and think comprehensively uh, about the work and about sort of what's going on in communities. Um, the, I, I sit in a brand new role, the Chief Equity Officer for the City of Chicago, uh, charged with building out a brand new office and body of work, the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. And uh, I get a lot of questions, and uh, the, they typically sort of sit around, well, how are you gonna solve equity for all the city of Chicago? Um, and I often respond, um, I, am not, but uh, if we work together, then we might be able to do something. Um, and I mean that to my core, that this work can't be about one person, it can't be about one office, it can't be about one initiative. If we're really serious about this work of equity, which is this idea that all people deserve and should have a fair shot at opportunity, and the way we do business so often does not allow a fair shot, because people are situated across society in all sorts of different ways that are both part of historical inequities, continuing inequities that we see every single day, that uh, we are not going to get that work done if we are not working together. And so I am so thankful for the opportunity to be here, to listen. Uh, some of the things that re I really reflected on, um, and it, it, there are things I talk about often, is that we have to be talking about equity both in outcomes but also in process. Uh, and outcomes, we want to see movement. We want to see more people who have uh, traditionally and historically been disadvantaged get more opportunities to get to our overall goals. And I think a lot of the work that I heard today is about trying to look at the data, look at the numbers, what gets measured gets done. Um, uh, we have to pay attention to outcomes, but we also can't forget about process. How are we going to do that? Who gets to make those decisions? Who gets to be in the room where it happens if you're a Hamilton fan? Uh, but, but, and, and listening to the parents talk about their experience in doing this work, the things that they've learned, the opportunities and the power of seeing their work done, 4,000 surveys and, or t testimonials being collected to really show the power that happens when parents speak up and are a part of these processes. These are fundamental to our sense of what equity means. Um, and, and then the last thing I'll just say is thinking about how we're pairing uh, the work and what we already have to do with opportunities to really solve challenges in creative ways. 
Um, this isn't just about adding a, a new grant to do this work all the time. Sometimes it's about thinking about the dollars that we already are spending and really thinking about how can they solve very unique challenges. This is why the example of the green storm infrastructure uh, uh, around the green space is really an, an important example. This is work that many our infrastructure services already need to do, but we're also pairing it with other needs and really thinking creatively. So I see my job as both connecting this work and trying to build a muscle across our city to really build and be responsive to this work and continue to grow so that we're thinking about things affirmatively and not just reactively. So um, I, I am so grateful again for this opportunity to listen. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing and I look forward to continued partnering. So now I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Allison Arwadi, the Acting Commissioner for the Chicago Department of Public Health. We're very fortunate to have had a very long and productive relationship with the department as we work to transform health services for low-income students, and we're very thrilled that she is uh, here to join us today. Thank you, and again, thank you so much for organizing this space and to all of you for really sharing your thoughts and your ideas. I love talking to folks who have ideas and then make action happen with them. So you know, thank you to, to that. And the same goes really for all of you. Um, when I think about the Healthy Schools campaign and the work that the Chicago Department of Public Health has been fortunate to do to support the Healthy Sh uh, Schools campaign and to support Healthy CPS, it's because we share values, we share values of equity, and we share values about actually working to make change, whether that's examples um, like what the principal was speaking about in his particular school, whether that's pushing on things like good food purchasing policies, whether that's thinking about opportunities for uh, recess or um, physical activity within the schools. Um, these are concrete things that can make a change for a child today, but then can make a change across the system. So uh, Chicago Department of Public Schools certainly is proud to support um, in all the ways that we're able to thinking about reductions in youth obesity. That includes things like increasing access to healthy foods through breakfast programs, healthy lunch, some of these things um, that you've brought up, through health and nutrition education, and through these healthy foods standards. Uh, we provide a lot of the data related to the outcomes, um, oops, like Ms. Moore was speaking about, it's okay. Um, but we're also thinking about how to expand and improve on uh, the work that is already happening. Some of you may know that the Chicago Department of Public Health does provide a lot of services in partnership with Chicago Public Schools. We think about equity in all of those decisions that we're making. So for example, uh, CDPH provides 700,000 immunizations every year across the city of Chicago you know, to children. Um, we do work directly in schools to make sure that kids are getting the immunization organizations that they need to be protected from disease and able to be in school and you know living and learning healthy. Uh, we also do direct uh, services in terms of dental care, so oral health exams and sealant placement. We've been doing that since about 2000, and we're almost to a million free exams that have been offered in CPS schools. Um, we had more than 70,000 last year in 488 schools. We think about things like vision making sure that children are having eye exams. Last year, um, providing 56,000 exams, and then on top of that, 28,000 pairs of free eyeglasses to make sure that kids are able to see the blackboard and you know do the basic work that's needed um, in school. And then we also partner on more specific things like uh, sexually transmitted infection, education, and testing. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, as the public health department, we're all about prevention. We're all about thinking about policies, systems, and environments. 
And the kinds of ideas that you are bringing up and saying that you're wanting to see more of are about creating those environments and making sure that our children have the opportunity to grow into healthier adults. Healthy Chicago 2.0, some of you may be familiar with, um, is the current Chicago Department of Public Health plan partnering toward health equity, really making sure that we're getting resources where they are most needed and tracking um, outcomes uh, to make sure that everybody is able to have the opportunity to live their healthiest life possible. We heard right up front about the life expectancy disparity across the whole city of Chicago. Um, someone who is a black Chicagoan is likely to live 8.8 .8 years less long than a white Chicagoan. In addition, we've seen Latinx Chicago in life expectancy dropping over the past few years to the point that for the first time it's actually below white life expectancy. The number one thing that drives this disparity in life expectancy is chronic disease, especially the chronic diseases cardiovascular cancers that are driven by obesity, that are driven by tobacco. So the work that we're doing today to think about creating healthy spaces in schools, healthy food, healthy opportunities for nutrition, set kids on the path to help us make a dent in those life expectancy disparities. So CPS um, is a wonderful partner of ours. Healthy Schools Campaign is an amazing partner, an amazing collaborator in terms of bringing these things to the forefront. Uh, Chicago Department of Public Health is really excited to keep working on all of these issues, including the mental and behavioral health, which you're going to be hearing more about uh, sort of in the weeks to come as we really thinking about health for all children here in Chicago. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, and we certainly wish you a lot of luck in your confirmation hearings, and um, um, it's obviously a, a, uh, a rough sport, sometimes Chicago politics, but <laughs> I think all of our public officials know that, so um, we wish you luck, and we look forward to working with uh, you. Again, um, on behalf of um, the Chief Education Officer, McDade, um, who asked me to extend her apologies for having to cancel in order to um, uh, address the obviously very time-pressing uh, negotiations with the Chicago Teachers Union. But as I look around the room, I see so many other of our friends within Chicago Public Schools who I know will help us make sure that uh, she hears the important messages that came from our panelists. And in particular, I wanted to, um, I think I saw Crystal, who, uh, oh, there you are, there, okay, who uh, runs the food program for Chicago Public School. No small task. Think how hard it is for you to get your kids to eat their vegetables, and she's got 400,000 kids twice a day, so <laughs> thank you for uh, taking time out to be here with us. I now uh, kind of on to our state officials, um, and we are so we were so pleased. Uh, and this is a, I'm putting them on the spot just a little bit, but um, I know with our long history of working with both uh, 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 Jesse and Chris that we're all kind of going in the same direction. Um, but um, we were really pleased when the Illinois State Board of Education adopted the explicit goal that every school offers a safe and healthy learning environment for all students. So we should all be very aware and proud of the fact that that is part of the uh, State of Illinois' uh, mission. Um, and we were really excited when Illinois, along with 35 other states, included chronic absenteeism rates as a measure of school quality on their state report card. Chronic absenteeism, is a, we see it as a reliable proxy of how well a school supports student health and wellness. 
we have been hearing that um, there's some discussion eliminating that from the school report card, and we certainly look forward to educating the new board of the new state board of education and leadership about the important uh, role that that can play in helping to support school districts and schools in addressing student health and wellness. Um, so I'm now pleased to introduce Krish Mohip, who is the Deputy Operational Education Officer, quite a title, yeah, for the Illinois State Board of Education. Krish is new to his role, but is a former teacher and principal. He understands what Chicago schools are facing. In fact, when he was principal of Walsh Elementary School, Mr. Mohip was an earlier and very important champion of our work to support student health and wellness. So we know that he has that on the ground, firsthand experience that he can bring to his colleagues at the state board. So Krish. Thank you for that introduction, Rochelle. Buenos tardes, good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I, as Rochelle mentioned, I started my career in the Chicago Public Schools as a kindergarten teacher and moved my way up throughout the ranks. Um, where I, by the time I left the Chicago Public Schools, I was the Chief Transformation Officer, and I think Jesse was my boss at that time uh, as the CEO. <laughs> Um, but I left to go to Ohio to do a state takeover. I was um, recruited by the governor of that area, uh, I'm sorry, of that state to do the uh, Ohio's first state takeover. But what brought me back to Illinois and to what, what, what really, I felt a, a pull to the State Board of Education was our new state superintendent, Dr. Carmen Ayala. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that Dr. Ayala is our first minority state superintendent um, in our state's history. She is of Hispanic descent. And if you've listened to my pronouns, she's also our first female state superintendent. So I think that's worth mentioning, um, the progressiveness that we see with our State Board of Education, which is also a very diverse group of, uh, of thought leaders within the state. Um, something that, as I got to meet and understand Dr. Ayala, that really has been a great surprise as I came in was her passion for every single child and her understanding of equity and what equity means. She also, there's a shift happening in the State Board of Education where we're not just focused on um, the support and, and the guidelines and the policies that are happening within the state, but it's also around performance management and ensuring that every single child is getting a quality education. And when we're finding that that's not happening, we're looking for ways to put systems of support in place so that we can improve the educational outcomes for every child. Another reason that I was drawn to the State Board of Education was our chief education officer. Um, and that's Ernesto Matias. Dr. Matias is from the Chicago Public Schools and well known, I'm sure many of you in this area know Dr. Matias. But the one thing he talks about every single time we meet, and he has in his office an empty chair. And in that empty chair, he calls it out and he says, this empty chair represents the two million plus students that we educate, that we're responsible for educating in the state of Illinois. And as we sit down at the table, we need to be cognizant of those two million children. But we also have to understand as a group when we're meeting, who also is not in the room. And that's a shift from a lot of the conversations that I've had in public education, because for the first time, at the heart, we're talking about equity, and we're talking about children, we're talking about African Americans, and we're talking about Hispanic students in underserved schools, and holding schools accountable to make sure that they are properly educating those children. So I just wanted to say that because it's really important to me that you understand that there is a shift and there is a change happening in the State Board of Education and it's a welcome shift and it is about truly doing what's right for children. One of the reasons, there's a lot of reasons I took this job, right? But another reason I took this job was in this portfolio of work was safe and, and, and healthy schools. Safety, um, health, nutrition were, was, a, was an important part of the portfolio of schools, and it was such that Illinois State Board of Education has created its, its own department where we are focused in just this area. And I wanted to highlight some of the work that we've been doing over the past few years. Um, right now, Project Illaware, Illinois Aware is um, closing out a five-year program where we have trained over, I'm sorry, over 2,000 adults have received training on health and wellness and youth mental health services, um, essentially first aid for children, and over 7,000 7, students have um, been recipients and have been able to um, find success through those, through those programs and through those adults. 
Uh, we do have an SEL community um, and committees that are meeting to talk about the importance of SEL, SEL standards, and how SEL should become part of the daily life of all students. I know in the Chicago Public Schools, from my experience, we have done a lot of work around um, social emotional learning. Um, I think that work needs to continue, but that work has not echoed across the state. There, there are places across the state of Illinois where these voices aren't, haven't been heard, where your voice hasn't been heard, where social emotional learning has not become uh, one of the, one of the, the, the pillars of, of educational improvement. So I'm very excited that part of the State Board of Education's work will be around social emotional learning. Um, the physical education, this is something I looked at as I was coming in as a principal at Walsh Elementary School. Physical education was something that was very important to me and ensuring that our students had at least 30 minutes of, of healthy, uh, moderate to um, intense physical activity every single day. I am proud to say that of all the PE waivers that are out there right now, we only have one school district that has applied for a school waiver. So as there's much more work that needs to be done around uh, physical education, getting students to be more active, having um, appropriate spaces for students to play. Um, we are doing the policy work of the State Board of Education to ensure that districts are not uh, applying for these waivers and are providing physical education for their students at least three days out of, out of a five day week. Um, the one thing that Rochelle brought up was chronic absenteeism that I, I want to have a, just a brief conversation about. And that's to clear up any misinformation around what is happening with chronic absenteeism across the state. Um, right now, we are considering whether chronic absenteeism should be a metric for state report cards and something that will impact designations. Um, we have not made a decision on whether chronic absenteeism should or should not be on that. We simply are asking the question, and this is what I engage in and I like so much about the leadership of ISBE is that we're extremely reflective. So just because we're asking the question doesn't mean it's something that's predetermined. We're not saying that we are doing this or we're not doing this. We want to hear from the field. And so as we have put this question around, around chronic absenteeism, we only, we only received 18 comments of, uh, around this issue, and most of the comments were in support of removing chronic absenteeism. The thought was that it, chronic absenteeism is something that um, impacts the school, but what we want to measure is how well the school, the school is engaging and working with students while they are in that building. Now, I understand that that is a double-edged sword. I think, there are, um, I think there are valid points on both sides. And so what we are doing now as a state agency is we are listening to the field. This week alone, we're meeting with IESB, the Illinois Association of School Boards, the Illinois Principals Association, um, and many other agencies to get feedback on um, the ESSA requirements and changes that we're considering making, and chronic absenteeism is one of those. Um, just today, or I'm sorry, yesterday I was made aware that this was a concern from the Healthy Schools Initiative. And um, we will be working with Rochelle. She is going to either come to Springfield or be on a phone call. Buses, Buses will do something, right? But she is going to meet with, the, um, with ISBE to have a conversation around what's happening, what they believe should happen with chronic absenteeism, and we truly are at this point, just listening. Again, I am extremely um, excited to be part of the School Board of Education, to be, part, to be in this new role, and to be back in Pilsen, which I consider home, as um, I spent seven of my best professional career uh, years here in the Pilsen neighborhood as I was the principal of Walsh Elementary School. I'm excited to see Principal Martinez at Orozco today, after this event, uh, to see the great work that he's doing at Orozco Elementary. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Well, thank you so much, Christian. Um, I'm not sure how we missed that opportunity to comment when the official comment period was there, so we certainly appreciate the opportunity to make sure that our voice is heard as the conversation goes forward. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Jesse Ruiz, the Deputy Governor. Um, Jesse is the former Chicago Public School, School Board of Education member, a former uh, CEO of Chicago Public Schools, a former Chicago Park District Board Chair, 
Um, and I'm sure I have missed a few things. Um, but we are obviously very confident that Jesse is prioritizing children and especially low-income children in his new role in the governor's office because he has consistently done that in his work on behalf of Chicago students and families. So we're so pleased to invite him here in his new role. Thank you, Rochelle. It's good to be back. I want to say, I think I chaired this luncheon a couple years ago. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, that was an important job that I, I, I had. And you forgot to mention that those were all volunteer gigs. Uh, I actually had a full-time law practice while I was doing all those things. But now I finally uh, responded to the governor's call when he said, basically, stop playing with public service and dive in head first. And so I resigned my law firm partnership of 22 years and, and became the deputy governor in, in January of this year. Uh, but it's something that, again, I've been passionate about throughout. I basically had two parallel careers as a corporate lawyer and, and serving on uh, school boards and commissions, the federal, state, and local level. Uh, and it is realized after 22 years of law practice, I realized this is my passion. passion. And as I get older, uh, I realize it's also in my best interest. It's in my self-interest because this work is critical. Uh, it's critical to all of us a and to the folks who provided their testimony. Thank you so much. Para las madres, gracias por abogar no solamente por sus hijos, pero por toda la comunidad. Es un beneficio para todos nosotros. Y muchísimas gracias por sus esfuerzos. Uh, and it's true. I say thanks for advocating for your children, for all our community's children, because it's a benefit to all of us. Uh, they are our future. Uh, I always joke around with my sons when my dad passed away at 96. His dad passed away at 94 in Mexico, probably never having seen a doctor all his life. I keep threatening my wife, I'm probably pushing for 100 uh, <laughs> with that gene pool. So, so I'm going to be around for a while, and I'm going to need somebody to take care of me and somebody who's going to make great policies for uh, those vulnerable populations like the, the uh, seniors and our most young. And so when Governor Pritzker, who I know has the same sentiment and beliefs at heart, uh, asked me to join his administration, I, I jumped at the chance. Uh, because he has been a champion of early childhood, that's something that we're going to do to get those uh, children the healthiest starts to their lives early on from the very beginning. We're going to be launching an early childhood funding commission because we do, uh, yes, uh, and, and we do a lot in our state. The governor in, uh, throughout his life has shown through his old personal foundation, uh, that, which is a leader, the, uh, the uh, JB and MK Pritzker Foundation in early childhood education and, and not just early childhood education, but early childhood care from not only, you know, sometimes we define it as, as uh, you know, three to five or just universal. No, we're talking prenatal to five and beyond and making sure that we get every ch single child and his mandate to me every single day is that every Illinois child must be kindergarten ready with everything they need and it varies those needs vary and equity is a priority and so when it was time to to uh, impanel the State Board of Education that was a a uh, top of mind priority and I'm like, I'll take a little bit of credit. Like I did uh, recruit Carmen Ayala for that position. Uh, and yeah, very proud that she is the first Latina and the first woman in over 130 years of state superintendents in the state's history. Uh, long overdue, but uh, she was chosen because she was hands down, regardless of ethnicity, gender, she was hands down the best candidate. And she's gonna do great work with Krish and, and his colleagues at the state board again, pursuing equity and wellness of all students. And she cares deeply about these issues and we're proud to support her. Uh, and we'll look forward to continuing the discussions with, uh, I have a bi-weekly call with Carmen and, and, and their, her board chair. Uh, and I'll raise the chronic uh, absenteeism indicator as well, chime in with my own voice uh, and my own thoughts. And, and uh, uh, Rochelle, you may not have had time to, to comment during the comment period, but you sent me a letter that I just handed to Krish while we were sitting up here on stage. So I'm like, I don't think your windows of opportunity are too closed uh, when it comes to advocating with this governor's administration and the State Board of Education. Uh, the other thing that, that I'm very proud of that we've done 
is uh, continuing to fund our evidence-based funding formula you know, this year to the tune of 375 million additional dollars and more to come. Yes, we have some, some uh, fiscal challenges in our state, but regardless, you know, as, the, as many folks I've heard in my years around public service, budgets are values documents. And you can see this governor's values and this administration's values by the priorities that we've done. And also uh, extending the, the um, federal poverty level to 200% for the child care assistance program and looking to leverage as much funding as we can. I know HFS will continue to discuss uh, its Medicaid state plan amendment and seeking more federal dollars so we can leverage all the state dollars we have at work. Uh, and, and again, working on the school construction task force because uh, which will come out hopefully in a couple of weeks. We're gonna have a task force to look at the capital, how we best utilize the capital funds under this new capital plan. Uh, there'll be a task force to look at the 15 year backlog of capital projects and amongst those priorities, yes, uh, health, life safety initiatives, but again, do we have facilities for uh, recess? Do we have facilities for, for uh, PE? Do we have all those facilities to make a, not only whiteboards and classrooms, yes, those are critical, but also those, those uh, facilities that schools need to take care of the entire well-being of every single child. So those will be front and center as we go about that work and produce that report in March to, to uh, give direction to all our districts across, our 852 districts across the state on how to best utilize those, those funds. So we look forward to continuing to work with the Healthy Schools campaign as I've done, gosh, now for about 15 years since I first got on the state board and I still remember Rochelle was one of those first folks to reach out uh, and, and uh, a testament to her dedication and passion has never stopped reaching out uh, over those 15 years. Uh, and and uh, I would you know, be shocked if you didn't. Uh, because the reason I, I do these efforts and the reason I chose to uh, leave a nice law practice was uh, because of everybody in this room. Because some of these challenges are daunting. Some of the work is incredibly daunting and, and, and some days like none of us can make a dent. And it's probably true. None of us can make a dent, but we can make a dent. And so I look forward to doing the, this work with all of you, with the input that I get. And sometimes, you know, it's critique, and I welcome critique. Uh, sometimes it's cajoling, and sometimes it's a pat in the back, sometimes it's a kick in the behind. Uh, but I welcome it all, because with those efforts and that passion, properly directed, uh, I know we can tackle some of these issues. So alone, yeah, we're not gonna do anything. Together we will. Together we'll go far, and again, it's for the future of those folks who are gonna take care of me when I'm an old guy. Uh, so thank you all for your efforts for, for supporting the Healthy Schools Campaign and we look forward to our continued work and partnership and your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Just to um, mention, about 15 or 16 years ago, a Healthy Schools Campaign developed construction guidelines on how to think about a healthy school environment. So. We will certainly like to share that with uh, you and others. Um, we produced that just as the state started, stopped constructing schools. <laughs> so um, it, 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 needs a, it needs some action. Yep. So we're, we'll be very, very excited to share that with a, with a budget attached to that. Um, but again, I want to just um, thank um, everyone uh, for participating in this um, conversation. It, it is somewhat of a unique program for a luncheon, but given the fact that we have new leaders at a uh, city level and at a state level, um, and um, you know some new folks at Chicago Public Schools, we really wanted to uh, take the opportunity to make sure that some of the community voices that we listen to and that we work with um, have a chance to uh, speak directly to some of our policy makers. So thank you all very much. So just a, a few kind of closing comments before I turn things back to Rob and then I'll let our panelists kind of get off the fishbowl and have a few macaroons or something to drink since they've been sitting up here during lunch. 
Um, at Healthy Schools Campaign, we are really committed to making sure that all students are in school healthy and ready to learn. You know, I am really proud of the holistic approach that we have and our multifaceted model. We engage, we advocate, and we build. Our school and community level programs and grassroots leadership, including these amazing parent leaders, creating a strong backbone for our advocacy work, keeping us grounded and accountable to the needs of schools and communities. In the past few years, we've taken on some exciting new challenges that we think will have a profound impact on this generation of children and generations to come. Uh, I think that for those of you who have been at a number of our events over the year, we're really excited to be able to really focus on expanding access to mental and behavioral health services and obviously continuing to speak out for, for justice for our children, communities, and families. Before I hand things back to Rob and let these folks get something to drink or eat, I want to again thank all of you who came and spoke today. I also want to thank the wonderful Healthy Schools Campaign Board and staff, our very generous sponsors, including our presenting sponsors, Advocates Children's Hospital and GCM Grosvenor, all of our sponsors, including those who donated their tables, allowing us to share this moment with so many parents, principals, school nurses, and community partners. I especially want to thank our parent leaders. There are literally hundreds of parents who are working in their schools and communities to make sure that their children are healthy in school and ready to learn. It was really hard to find three parents to represent all of them, but the three of you did a great job. But I would love to have all of those parents who are in the room stand up to be recognized. Thank you again, parents. Um, we know what a tough job being a parent is and making sure that you have time and space in your day and a commitment to making sure that our schools and communities are working for everyone's children is, is so important. So with that, I am really pleased to reintroduce Rob Rogers, our uh, board chair who will tell you a little bit about the school tour that's coming up. So um, stay tuned. So thank you. So as I deliver my comments, uh, panelists, please feel free to uh, walk off the stage and uh, grab a table and a, and a drink and a bite to eat. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just a few more minutes and then we'll get to go outside and enjoy this uh, beautiful fall day. Our luncheon is coming uh, to a close, but we have an amazing opportunity for all of you. We're just a, a few minutes, a walk across the, uh, the field to the dynamic space to grow schoolyard at Arosa School. So I want to acknowledge uh, Principal Martinez uh, for his leadership and uh, hope you all get a chance to walk over and see the uh, beautiful school schoolyard. Why are these schoolyards so beneficial to children and communities? Schoolyards support active play and positive social interactions in a vast body of research documents nature's benefits on human health. We also know that low-income communities are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change because of issues ranging from chronic health conditions to housing and economic insecurity. Currently, over 8,000 students have the opportunity to learn and play in Space to Grow Schoolyard, but we know there are tens of thousands more who could and should benefit. So please feel free to join us for a short walk over and experience firsthand the schoolyard, which is transforming the school experience for Arosa students and building a stronger sense of community in this dynamic neighborhood. Hearing about these great spaces is amazing, but seeing and walking on the grounds where the kids play and learn every day is something that should not be missed. The Healthy Schools campaign, campaign team will lead the way and have some more information as you exit. Thank you again for being here today and thank you for supporting this important work.